So we're delighted to have with us uh, today uh, the author of a new book uh, that has, was published in October. Uh, Tina Kelly is actually a, uh, a person who grew up in Morristown, uh, went to the Woodland School, for those of you who are from Morristown and familiar with the, our school district. Uh, she then uh, actually graduated from high school in Mendham. She worked for the New York Times. She had a career as a journalist. In fact, some of you may have read uh, the many uh, very moving, touching, brief biographies of persons who were killed during the September 11th attacks. Uh, Tina wrote, I think, 121 of those uh, uh, short essays, uh, which is really quite a, and as a result, uh, got a Pulitzer Prize, uh, shared a Pulitzer Prize with her colleagues from the New York Times for that. But more recently, she's been working at Covenant House, uh, which is a facility, actually several facilities throughout the country, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. And uh, she wrote a book uh, with the executive director of Covenant House, uh, which is called Homeless to Hope. And so uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Tina Kelly. Tina, please join us. Thank you so much for coming out today. I don't think I've ever been extra credit before. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a little bit about my, my history as a, as a writer and how I came to do this project. I grew up, as, as um, Dr. Yaw said, in Morris County. My first reporting job was covering the track team for the Observer Tribune um, in, in, Mar in Mendham. I was actually on the track team, but they let me cover it. And um, I went on after college to work at the Philadelphia Inquirer in the Cherry Hill Bureau and covering South Jersey, and then on to the Patriot Ledger in Quincy, Massachusetts, several papers in Seattle, the New York Times for 10 years, and then um, probably the best so far in terms of job has been to write this book. It's called Almost Home, Helping Kids Move from Homelessness to Hope. I came to do the project because when I was working at the Times, I was covering the child welfare system, uh, foster care, and all the problems that were going on um, in around two, the mid-2000s when there were um, terrible need for reform in, in the foster care system. And I was writing about Kevin Ryan, who at first was the child advocate for the state of New Jersey, um, uncovering all sorts of injustices regarding juvenile detention, mentally ill young people, and um, kids who were just languishing in foster care. I also um, wrote about kids who are waiting um, to be adopted, kids who are waiting to get back to their um, birth families. And in the course of writing about these issues, I came to know Kevin. Um, in 2009, I was working on a hyper-local blog that was the New York Times' um, attempts to do kind of what Patch does now. I was covering Maplewood, Milburn, and South Orange in a little blog with part of the New York Times. And um, there was an offer that they were trying to um, reduce their staff at the Times, and they offered a buyout. So I called around, and I asked people I knew if they knew of anyone who needed someone to write um, anything in the nonprofit world. I'd always been interested in that world. And I called Kevin, and he said, well, we really are looking for someone to write a book about the transformations that happen with our young people. So I had respected him greatly when I was covering him as a reporter, and I um, had a wonderful time writing this book with him. Uh, if people have questions about the actual writing process, I'd be happy to answer them later. Um, but it was um, very fulfilling, and we were able to bring these six stories of homeless young people to the world's attention. A lot of people don't know about the issue of youth homelessness. There are um, two million young people each year in the United States who have an episode of homelessness. Can anyone raise their hand if they've ever been homeless or know someone who has been? So it's, it's something that you don't, people don't realize that it happens, but it does. Uh, oftentimes homeless young people don't want to be seen as homeless. It makes them more vulnerable to being exploited. So they will dress perfectly well. Their school people might not know it. Their families might not even know it. One of the young people in this book was, work, was working full time in the shelter in Los Angeles. 
and her family never knew that she wasn't staying with friends. They, they would have been ashamed of her if she were staying in a homeless shelter, but um, they were the reason she was staying in the homeless shelter. So uh, in, the course of, in the course of the book, we got Cory Booker, uh, the mayor of Newark, to write the foreword for, for the book. We have a, a shelter in Newark about three blocks from City Hall. And he's always been very supportive of our work. So I'd like to start off by reading a little bit about um, his, his thoughts on youth homelessness. I've learned that real heroes usually aren't the kind of people you read about in newspapers or see on TV. Real heroes are usually the ones concerned with the least glamorous of things. In fact, I've come to believe strongly that the most heroic or biggest thing we can do in any day is a small act of decency, kindness, or love. This is my favorite sentence in the whole book, so if you, if you don't pay attention for the rest of the hour, just remember this sentence. What frustrates me is that so often we allow our inability to do the big things to undermine our determination to do the small things, those acts of kindness, decency, and love that in their aggregate over days, weeks, and years make powerful change. Corey goes on, my parents raised me to know this. They raised me to understand that I was the result of a vast and profound conspiracy of love. My father, for example, was born poor. In fact, he jokes now that he wasn't born poor, he was born po. He couldn't afford the other two letters. He was born to a single mother who couldn't take care of him, and after his grandmother couldn't take care of him either, it was the kindness and love of strangers that stabilized his life and gave him a foundation to eventually head off to college. This past Thanksgiving, as my family was going around the table saying that what we were thankful for, my father got a little emotional talking about his childhood and how people whose names he couldn't even remember helped him. He talked about how when he was college aged, people reached out and gave him dollar bills to ensure he could afford his first semester's tuition. Time and again, my parents reminded me that there were thousands of people over numerous generations who did for my family and our ancestors. All that I have now is the result not only of famous people from history, but mostly of ordinary Americans who showed ordinary kindness, small acts that were not required of them, but that they just did. I am proud of that part of our American history. I am proud that although I didn't know their names, there were so many people who just did. They mentored and marched, they served and sacrificed, they loved. When I started writing this book, I wanted to be sure that it wasn't going to be depressing. Some of the, the background stories of the young people who come to the homeless shelters run by Covenant House are gruesome. They've been horribly abused or thrown out by their parents. They've been told over and over again that they were worth nothing. And I wanted to make sure that we talked about the, the good news of what happens to them at these shelters and also the things that other people can do to help prevent youth homelessness. Because two million people in America who are between the ages of 18 and 24 should not have to live on the streets, should not have to find themselves with nowhere to go. One of the biggest areas where the um, number of homeless young people could be reduced is by fixing the foster care system. Um, at this stage, 28,000 young people a year age out of foster care without having a permanent home. So when the money for their foster parents runs out at 18, they have nowhere to go, they have a, a dysfunctional family that they were left by, and the foster care parents are no longer there or no longer funded to help them. So that's a huge percentage, 11% of kids in foster care age out that way with nowhere to go. But there are ways to, um, to address those young people. 40% of them end up homeless before their mid-20s because they had very little um, in terms of resources and, and cushion to fall back on. If they've been moved in foster care from place to place, they often end up with educational deficits because you lose about six months each time you have to change schools as a foster kid. The young man that we write about from Houston moved 35 times. So he was so far behind the eight ball when it came to education. He was reading at a second or third grade level when he was 18. 
and landed on our doorstep on his 18th birthday. Um, with the help of Covenant House, within a year he got his um, GED. So he was much smarter than anyone had told him he was. He'd been just passed through the system and people would um, promote him to the next grade, but he wasn't, um, he didn't believe in himself educationally. But with the help of tutors, he was able to go on to college and now he wants to get his master's and become a school principal. Um, one way to reduce the number of kids in foster care who are aging out without a permanent home is to focus on adopting out the young people who've been there the longest. That's one of the things that um, Kevin Ryan did when he was running the child welfare system. He focused on the 100 kids who'd been there longest. Some of them had been in foster care for 12 years and made an all out effort to make sure that they didn't age out of foster care without either a legal guardian or a permanent adoptive home. Um, another way that we can fix the foster care system is by using retired detectives. This is one of my favorite um, recommendations from the book. In St. Louis, the child welfare system hires retired detectives to do the legwork to find relatives for kids who are in foster care. Not just the mother and the father, who everybody pretty much has the contact information for, but great aunts and cousins and people who, when they're called up, and hear that one of their relatives is in the foster care system, they will often say, well, why don't we raise them? Why don't we take in our own blood relatives? So the kids who are in that program have a 70% success rate getting a permanent home compared to only 40% for other kids in foster care. So that's a program that if that could be universalized around the country, it could significantly reduce the number of kids who are in foster care and age out and become homeless. Let me read a little bit about um, the young man that I mentioned who was um, in so many placements. He um, has scars on his hands from when he was 18 months old and his mother was hearing voices and she um, submerged his hands in very, very hot water. So he suffered burns, he was in the hospital for months. She went to jail for it, his dad disappeared and he went into foster care. He went back to live with his family for five years, but they continued to be um, terribly abusive, and he spent the last of his teenage years in foster care. So he had, understandably, a huge amount of anger that was building up um, throughout his childhood, and when he came to Covenant House, he did really well in the beginning. He went to the transitional living program right away because he was able to find two jobs, but he was still dealing with some of his inner demons and I'm talking here about the relationship he had with his counselor, whose name was Mr. Todd, and the young man's name is Benjamin. One morning, Mr. Todd, then 34, was driving to work when his pager received a 911 message from the staff at the Rites of Passage Transitional Living Apartments. As he sped his green Toyota into the driveway of the slightly run-down brick building, he heard Benjamin storming out the front door. What the hell is he going to do? He's not my daddy, Benjamin shouted in the streets. Who are you talking about, Mr. Todd said. I'm talking about you, Benjamin replied. Mr. Todd headed inside where he learned from a coworker that Benjamin had been acting aggressively and not following directions. Benjamin came back inside, interrupting their conversation and walking up to Mr. Todd. The counselor asked a couple of the kids hanging out in his office to clear out so that he and Benjamin could talk privately. You don't tell me what to do, Benjamin said. Benjamin, you're in my personal space right now, Mr. Todd said. Benjamin is 6'6", six, six, and he's, um, he, uh, he's been able to bench press 495 pounds. So at this stage, he was a little smaller than that, but he was still a formidable young man. He shaves his head. He, he's, um, he, when he gets angry, he like, takes his shirt off and gets ready to start fighting, because that was how he was able to survive in the um, tough areas of Houston where he was raised, or where he wasn't raised, but where he grew up. So Mr. Todd says, let me be honest right now, Mr. Todd is feeling threatened. You need to feel threatened, Benjamin replied. Mr. Todd told him to pack up his things. You're just like my family, Benjamin hollered, cursing, slamming the door and heading upstairs. It was the worst thing he could have said to Mr. Todd, who knew how badly Benjamin had suffered as a child. He followed Benjamin up the stairs. His colleague asked if he wanted backup. No, I got it, Mr. Todd said, and knocked on Benjamin's door. 
When he heard no reply, he used his key to open the room and found Benjamin cramming the contents of the top drawer of his dresser into a black duffel bag. Mr. Todd called his name, but Benjamin didn't say anything. Instead, he spun around to face Mr. Todd, threatening to hit the counselor if he didn't get out of his face. But Mr. Todd, who is six feet tall and stocky, grabbed Benjamin's collar, twisted it, and lifted Benjamin's chin up in the air. His words were spot on. Don't you ever speak to me like that again, Mr. Todd said. I'm nothing like your family. I never treated you like your family did with the horrible things you say they did. I've been here to support you. I love you. I'm going to be here to the very end. The words washed over Benjamin like the first showers after a Houston drought. Right then, Benjamin broke down and for the first time in a long while cried. I'm so sorry, he wept into Mr. Todd's shoulder. So, so sorry. Mr. Todd held him firmly, shooing away another counselor. After Benjamin apologized to the staff and accepted the consequences for his outburst, he was allowed to stay on. Benjamin looked back on the confrontation as a pivotal moment in his life when he could step away from anger as his default mode for relating to people. The hour that he and Mr. Todd spent talking was a breakthrough. For once, he saw someone stand up to him and stand up for him. Someone cared, refusing to pass him along to the next institution. Had Mr. Todd really just said, I love you? We have to separate the behavior from the kid, Mr. Todd had said later. It's the behavior that's bad, but you're a good kid. You are a treasure. So what, what we found in the course of the research for the book was that often all it took was one person believing in a young person unequivocally um, with unconditional love and respect to help that young person bloom. So often they'd been told by their families that they were worthless, that they weren't good enough to stay at home. But the young people had their own dreams that were just undiscovered or had been tamped down by their families. But once they were in a supportive situation, their native resilience came out. And the resilience of the young people in this book um, just floored me when I was reporting on it. Let me stop and see if anyone has any questions, because I sort of want to gauge as to which stories might be of interest later on for me to go into. Does anyone have any questions yet? Okay. Um, one of the m issues of youth homelessness that's been coming up um, in the media a lot lately is the issue of, of sex trafficking. And um, we've run across a number of young people, mostly, mostly young women, um, who've been prostituted out um, in the course of their childhoods up until you know, age 18 and beyond. Uh, it's a federal crime to sell a young person for sex, but um, the enforcement of those laws has been lacking. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a young woman in um, Vancouver, British Columbia. She was um, prostituted out from when she was nine, from in th by three different pimps um, by the time she was 20. And her, her backstory is pretty interesting. She was adopted by a white family in a suburb of Vancouver. And um, she was from the Philippines. She was the ninth child of someone who was a, a substance abuser. And so she had fetal alcohol syndrome. But it wasn't, it wasn't diagnosed until she was 19 or so. So sometimes with fetal alcohol syndrome, the earlier you are diagnosed with that, the better you can fare because you can get more services and more um, educational help. But she was very late coming to that diagnosis. It's also a, a difficult diagnosis um, in that a lot of times it leads young people to make bad decisions, to take risks, and to act out sexually. And the pimps know that. If they're on the street looking for um, young, predominantly young women who are unattached, a lot of those girls end up having fetal alcohol syndrome and being liable to not making decisions in their best interest. So she was also um, very addicted to drugs at the time that she came to Covenant House. She said there wasn't a day between when she was 17 and 18 that she wasn't high. She, from the age of 12, was getting ecstasy, um, cocaine, alcohol, all sorts of drugs. Um, and became quite addicted, so she was also very easily manipulable that way. 
she came to the shelter after getting kicked out of rehab for fighting. Um, she was almost at the end of six months of a rehab program in British Columbia, and her parents said, well, you can't come home. You, you got kicked out. You didn't finish rehab, so you're on your own. And she went to Covenant House in Vancouver, where she was in and out four or five different times. But um, in the end, she, um, she was able to stick with the program there. And is, is I don't want to give away the end, but it's, it's a good story. Um, here's, here's one scene from it. It was early in the morning, late in September 2010, a Monday, the day Nancy Brown always heard appeals, one after another, from kids who wanted to come back into Covenant House. They had all been discharged recently for not following their plans, for fighting, or for being under the influence of drugs or alcohol. They all wanted a second chance, or a fifth, or a sixth. Sister Nancy, a gray-haired neighbor neighborly woman with a hearty laugh, sat at a round table in her bright office, looking across at Muriel, a 19-year-old with a vulnerable, shop-worn beauty. The girl acted unhealthy and perplexed. Six Sister Nancy saw familiar signs of exhaustion and drugs, but could also see the struggle in her. Muriel was working for an escort service, and part of her wanted to be safe instead. Sister Nancy, one of Vancouver's most visible opponents of sex trafficking, sensed a window of opportunity. The staff had recently asked Muriel to leave because she was not following her plan, not trying hard enough to find a safe job. They worried that she was just refueling, enjoying a short respite before returning to work as an escort. From Sister Nancy's earlier work with domestic violence victims, and now after coming to understand the seedy underground of Vancouver, she knew the struggle to leave a dangerous situation needs to take priority over other goals. She knew the figures. Between 85 and 95% of prostituted people want to leave their situations, but there are only a handful of shelter beds in North America available to them. Although young people see Sister Nancy as an authority figure at first, she has a passion for justice as well as a soft spot for earnest kids. Maybe, she thought, finding a job had not been the wisest priority for someone as young looking as Muriel, who had a limited work history. When Muriel explained in a fast flowing, girlish voice, I'm really lost, I want to get my life back, get back into school and do something, rather than traveling around with a suitcase, Sister Nancy knew what her answer to this appeal would be. A member of the Sisters of Charity Halifax, who wears slacks and a sweater rather than a habit, Sister Nancy felt grateful to work in a shelter where Muriel could be safe, where drugs and alcohol are not permitted, and where full-time addiction specialists are on staff. She vividly remembers the snapshots in the newspaper of the sad-eyed, disheveled victims of Willie Picton, the pig farmer who confessed in 2007 to killing 49 women, mostly local prostitutes and addicted young people. His depravity still haunts the city. Muriel appeared sincere and seemed less damaged by drugs than many of the sex trafficking victims Sister Nancy meets. Hardest to reach are the many girls who are doubly ensnared by the threats and brainwashing that can come with prostitution and by the physical and psychological ravages of addiction. Which problem do you tackle first? How do you help a young person realize that her pimp is manipulating her when he feeds her the drugs that she craves? Would she go back to her pimp if kicking drugs proved too hard and she needed a free high? Would she go back to drugs to numb the pain of seeing with newly clear eyes how her pimp had exploited her to, or to avoid the pain of losing the relationship with him which she had come to need? Looking down at the five foot two, 99 pound woman child across from her, Sister Nancy knew that any young person involved in prostitution was probably there because her family or community had rejected her. Sister Nancy had no interest in rejecting Muriel further and sending her back to the streets. There were already about 10,000 trafficked youth in Canada each year, and Sister Nancy wanted to help this girl step away from that life. She said she was happy to see Muriel again and thanked her for returning. I want you to come back into the shelter, rest, and start working on your plan, Sister Nancy said. Muriel exhaled for what seemed like the first time all morning as Sister Nancy encouraged her to think about her worth as a woman and as a person so she could be strong in the choices she would make for herself. The nun asked her how the shelter could help her get her life back. Muriel didn't know exactly, but would try to figure it out during her fourth stay at the shelter. 
according to the antiseptic description in the daily resident logs, which includes counselor notes from each eight-hour shift, quote, youth indicated that she does not want to return to sex trade and really wants to return and live with her mother, must get job, work at schooling, stay clean and sober. It was a formidable order. Sister Nancy would be watching, trying to help Muriel exit prostitution for good. As Muriel headed downstairs to rest, she shook her head at how much work it would take just to get back home. <laughs>